The nation's biggest gambling business, Tabcorp, this week made another big bet on its casino operation, anteing up an extra $285 million on its existing $600 million renovation job at Star City in Sydney. But it's been another tough year for Tabcorp, with profits down 10%, revenues flat, and regulatory threats in wagering and poker machine businesses always lurking in the background. I spoke to Tabcorp chief Elmer Funke Cooper about the punt he's taking. Well, Elmer Funke Cooper, Tabcorp's gradually becoming a casino company, isn't it? Well, I think it's a, a default outcome of, of the way our business is structured. In Victoria, we'll, uh, the license will fall away in 2012. That will make gaming a smaller part of our business. And at the same time, we're making very significant investments in our casinos business. So, uh, And we're doing that because that's where we have the right conditions, long-term licenses, attractive markets, and opportunity for growth. Uh, so the outcome is that we'll become more of a casino business as a result of the investments that we're making. So what, what sort of uh, proportions will it be in, say, five years' time? Uh, well, that would be telling you what our results will be in five years' time, and we prefer not to do that. Uh, but we're, we're investing, well, broadly speaking, we're, we're, we're investing today uh, close to a billion dollars in our New South Wales casino. Uh, so if you think about returns in the order of 14 to 15 percent, that EBITDA will start to grow at very significant rates. Uh, and at the same time, gaming will fall away. It's about 22 percent of the company. Uh, so currently, casinos is one-third of the larger company, and it will start to creep up to half or more than half of the smaller companies, purely as a natural consequence of those two events. And what about wagering, uh, given the competition from online online betting? Well, wagering was our star performer last year. Uh, turnover up 7.5%, earnings up 4%, and it is despite the additional race fields fees and despite a significant increase and uneven competition that we're seeing. So uh, the wagering team has done a terrific job over the last few years repositioning that business for that new environment, and in 2010 we saw the benefits of that. But even though wagering uh, revenues were up reasonably strongly, about 7.5%, wasn't most of that in fixed odds, which is lower margin business? Uh, well, it's lower margin margin at the customer level, the translation to earnings is more complex because of fees and taxes. Uh, one way to look at it is our EBIT margin. Our EBIT margin was constant at about 15.7% in that business. So all that growth has translated at bottom line growth at a constant margin. And that's, I think, exactly what you want to see in that business. Is it fair to say that the tote has stalled? Well, the stout had no growth for us. Yeah. Uh, our market share is stable to us. Will up. it ever have growth again, the tote? Uh, well, I think the tote is an important product in the landscape here. Uh, we see a lot of growth coming out of fixed alts, sports betting, and racing, uh, and we're driving that very hard. And that's where part of the future is. Uh, but the tote continues to play an important part. To some degree, it will depend on the way governments and racing industries charge for all these products to what degree we can get these product balances right. Uh, the incentive today is to grow fixed odds, and that's what's happening. Just on the casino billion-dollar expansion, in one way, um, renovations always turn into a sinkhole for money, don't they? Is that how we should look at this, that, that you've got to spend more and more money on the thing? Uh, well, actually, if you look at the announcement we made today, is it made up of three components. There's the base project, $600 million. That project hasn't changed in its scope, and it's on track. Uh, what we're doing today is we're announcing two additions that really fulfill the total potential of that market. Well, there's 25 million extra. There's about 25 million dollars uh, extra that, because we're, uh, that's true. stuff that you're already doing, right? Yeah, so we're upgrading the technology in the new hotel, uh, make that better for consumers. We're doing some extra fit out on, on restaurants. Uh, on $960 million, that's not really the issue. Uh, what we did announce today uh, is a $100 million commitment to build an event center there, 3,000 seats, uh, which really fulfills a gap in the New South Wales market. Uh, and that will be for major entertainments, it will be for conferences, exhibitions, is that a profitable business? I mean, isn't that a lower margin business than everything else you do? It is, it is in itself a lower margin business. What it does is it makes the most of the infrastructure that, be, that you build in the entire casino. So it's the traffic jet it, get it, that it generates and it's the brand that it generates that makes it work for the entire casino. It will be okay in its own right, but of course the profitability out of things like gaming You mean it'll is break high. even in its own right? It'll actually... It will be okay in its own right. Uh, but it, what we're creating here is not an event Center. What we're creating is an entertainment destination. Uh, and if you look at the size of Sydney relative to any other market in this country, it's uh, the far biggest market. And if you look at what other casinos are investing, uh, an investment of close to a billion dollars actually makes sense. And you're spending $160 million on VIP, part of which, possibly a large part of which, is on planes. Mm -hmm. Once again, the VIP part of the business, the lowest margin. 
Uh, yeah, this so, is quite So it will also drag your overall margins down. Uh, well, actually, our, uh, our uh, EBIT and EBITDA margins for the casino will be relatively stable throughout this project in sort of the high 20s. Uh, the reason the VIP investment is interesting is that it's a very high um, growth market and a very large market here in Asia. And what we've seen is despite the uh, additional capacity that we've seen in Macau and Singapore, we're seeing very strong growth in the Australian market. We haven't really participated in that because we haven't invested. So our market share, which was in the 30s, is now sitting at sort of 15 to 20 percent. Uh, we've held our own in earnings because the market has grown. We haven't just we haven't participated in the growth. With the infrastructure we're building at Star, we have the opportunity to offer the right product. To, uh, to that consumer. So we think the business case for that actually is the easiest one out of all the things that we're doing, given the attraction of Sydney, the property that we're building and the size of that market. Looking at your results overall, you know, you can't help actually getting the, the sense that Tabcorp is just a tax collection business, or at least largely a tax collection business. You know, 67% uh, of the gaming goes in taxes and 60% on wagering. I mean, do you think um, that the governments that are getting this money from you treat you properly? Uh, so we have a good relationship with all the state governments that we, we operate in. They, I would say that we have... your licenses all the time? Do, do, you, well, get, do you really think uh, you're being treated uh, uh, well for we're, the, we're the, we're the amount of money you give them? Uh, we're, we're at the behest of, uh, of the licenses that we have. Uh, and what you're starting to see is that we invest in stable regulatory conditions and long-term licenses. I mean, the attraction of the casinos business, for example, in Sydney, is that it's a license that has some 80 years to go still. Uh, uh, so it's a very long-term license. We have 12 years exclusivity, and we have an arrangement there where we are able to grow. So it's not surprising that that's where the investment goes, because that's where we can have confidence of the returns. Um, but we are at the behest of what license conditions look like, and we make never an excuse for that. Uh, what we'd like to see, of course, is investment conditions that are attractive for us. So uh, because if the conditions are attractive, we'll put our money into it. And that's why the money goes into casinos uh, right now in Sydney, because that's where the conditions are. In gaming, you're moving in towards the servicing of the clubs that are going to end up with your licence, really. I mean, are you anywhere, ever going to come anywhere near replacing the revenue you're going to lose by servicing those clubs? Uh, listen, the business that we have in gaming in Victoria is extraordinarily attractive. It has a, an EBIT of more than $200 million. It's about you know, more than 20% of the company. That's falling away. That's done a couple of years ago. Uh, we've announced today that we've signed up 6,000 machines and more than 120 venues to our new business. Uh, that will make about $30 million more if we get more machines. So there's upside here, but it will never be like that. I think one of the things we have to remember, though, Alan, is that if we had renewed our license on the old structure, which is now irrelevant, uh, we would have had to pay for that license, which would also reduce the net earnings that are available to shareholders. So, you know, that business has been extraordinarily attractive for 15 years. Uh, that license structure has changed, but that attractiveness of the profitability was always going to go at some point uh, because a new license would have been a more expensive license. That's just the reality of it. And what about wagering? Are you, are you confident you'll retain the license in Victoria? Uh, I'm not in a position to make any comment uh, about uh, the Victorian license process, and so I can't. You're going to bid? Uh, it's public information that we've been invited to bid, and that was announced uh, last week, but I make no further comment. Thanks for joining us. You're welcome. Thank you.